Just stay right there. We're fine. We're fine. So I'm calling the, no, come on. I've got to stay eight inches away. Here we go. I'm going to try and remember. I'm calling the March 11th, 2020 Community Researchers Committee meeting to order. It is 8.31 a.m. Um, we do have a quorum in the room, even if you cannot see that on video. Hello. <laughs> so we, we may, this may get more popular on videos to not see anyone as we try to maintain social distance in this new era. Um, but we are on video. So with that, the before I get to the first item on our agenda, I would like to welcome our new minute taker, Lindsay, who is off to the side but is here. Thank you. And for her benefit, can we all at the table introduce ourselves for this meeting so she knows who's talking when we talk? Let's start over here. I'm Kathy Angelis. And I am the chair, Mandy Joe Haneke. I'm Andy Steinberg. Steve Schreiber. And I will say, and I'll, I'll get to this later, but I think we have two future members in the audience too, and I'll get to this when we get to announcements, but, but those are Evan Ross and Shalini Balmilne. Bal um, you will see them in the meeting, upcoming meeting. With that, we will move to general public comment. Is there any general public comment? I am, she shook her head. <laughs> she shook her head, I saw it. <laughs> so. That means we are moving on to action items since there is no general public comment. The first action item in an abundance of caution was the election of a chair and vice chair. The appointments for the committees were made effective next week, so we are not doing that item until next week. <laughs> nope, they're not technically members too, so they are not members till next Monday. So we are cutting that out. It will show up on next week's agenda. That takes us to item B which is the transfer of outstanding CRC referrals to the Town Services and Outreach Committee. We are doing a lot of housekeeping today. So those members who are moving to Town Services and Outreach in the room, pay attention, but we, there will be a memo. <laughs> so there are three referrals I believe we need to transfer. I will read them all and then we will take a motion and vote. Um, the first one is a request to adopt MGL Chapter 90, Section 17C and 18B, which was referred to both the Community Resources Committee and the Transportation Advisory Committee on May 6th. Um, the second is a proposal by Archipelago Investments and this for the Spring Street North parking, side parking from Boltwood Avenue to Churchill Street, which was referred to the Community Resources Committee seeking a report from the council with updated conceptual drawings by November 18th. So it's a little outdated, but the, um, we've been in contact with Archipelago and they have been okay with us not addressing it recently. We, we have made sure that we are not falling behind on that one for in terms of their construction. Um, and so that was referred on September 9th, 2019. And then the last one is a vote. Um, so the referral is the downtown parking study and memo from the downtown parking working group which was referred to the Community Resources Committee, seeking a report back to the Town Council on the priority recommendations of the Downtown Parking Working Group within 90 days, but the whole study was referred. And that was referred on November 18th. The CRC did report back to the Council on the priority recommendations, so essentially the transfer of this one would be the full Downtown Parking study that sits in CRC right now for we're not sure exactly what purposes at this point, but we're going to send it off to the, trans the town services that now has public ways. So um, can I get a motion to transfer those three identified referrals to the town services and outreach committee? I so move and then I have uh, um, just a general comment uh, to make with it. Okay, so as do I have a second? So Andy moved, Pat seconded your comment, Andy? Yeah, um, I think that the one thing, and this is actually in particularly in re reference to the um, first one, um, because we had a very good presentation regarding the whole speed limit issue and the complexity of it that involved um, Officer, um, now Captain Tang of the Police Department and um, I think uh, our town engineer Jason Skeels and 
if there's um, if that's available on um, video or through the minutes, I would encourage that that information be transferred to the committee so for their benefit. Thank you for that. Um, so the plan is not just to transfer the referral. I, I will add that onto the list. Um, there are some nice maps that have been created that we haven't actually seen because we haven't addressed it about where speed limits are and what they are in town. So I was gonna transfer a whole bunch of stuff along with this that says here's some documents um, too to go along with it. Um, but I will make sure I include any prior discussions that we have had and where those minutes and those minutes and then maybe link to the videos for those discussions specifically for speed limits, but I think we've also had some discussions on Spring Street, too. Um, so I will make sure I, when I transfer them that I look all of that up and hand them as much information as possible. So thank you for the reminder. Any other comments on this? Seeing none, all those in favor of the vote, the motion to transfer those three referrals to TSO, uh, raise your hand and say aye. 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 That is four zero with one absent. Um, and the absent member is Dorothy Pam for the purposes of our minute taker. <laughs> our next item of business then is the transmittal of the CRC process for advising council community impact review, which we adopted on 2020-02-12. Um, this is something that I put on here as a potential to transmit to TSO as a, um, given, giving them an option of, it's something we've adopted when we're going to be looking at stuff. Um, although we have not used it yet, I thought it could be helpful for the start of their discussions on stuff too. Um, so I thought we could potentially formally vote to say, hey, this might be helpful to you. We've adopted it. Um, do what it, do with it what you want. But, um, so that's why this is on here. Um, I would obviously transmit the whole document to them with a memo that says CRC has adopted it. We have not used it, so we don't know how well it works, but it could be a starting point for reviews by town services. Um, do I have a motion to transmit that process? Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the transmittal of this process? Anything you would like me to include in the memo as to potential uses or reasons or anything or? Nope. Okay, then all those in favor of transmitting that process, raise your hand and say aye. aye. That is a four to zero vote with one absent and it will be transmitted too when I and those are our, mostly our housekeeping measures, which gives us, leaves, leads us to action item 3D, the master plan update revisions. And so I forgot to include, I apologize, Pat, I just had discussion and feedback on current proposals. I should have included report from our representative <laughs> on that list. So, <laughs> so, so Pat, you were at, you were at the last planning board meeting, so can you tell us what the discussions, they had that on their agenda? Can you just update us on yeah. what happened there? Uh, Christine Bestrup, the planning director. Yeah, can you hold the mic? Right, Christine Bestrup, the planning director, plans to go forward section by section with the master plan, starting with land use. Uh, she's currently reviewing and assembling information regarding plans and her actions completed ongoing or still undone since 2010. Um, she's working um, with IT on the GIS system to gather information regarding land and conservation, APR, agricultural, institutional, commercial, retail, industrial, residential development, and development with mixed incomes, et cetera. She's reached out to department heads on town staff to let them know about the master plan update project and to seek help in gathering data and information about what the town has done and how it has changed in 10 years. Um, 
and she's uh, the planning board chair is working with IT to establish a website to keep public uh, inform the public informed about pro the project and seek input from the public on a regular basis. And that's basically what happened. So I'm correct. Am I correct in saying they didn't have any actual proposed revisions yet? Is there an estimate of time as to when the first proposed revisions might come out? Okay, so there was no estimate of time there, so good to know. Any questions? Welcome, Dorothy. <laughs> it's, it's doing us all in. Um, we just heard an update from Pat on the uh, master plan, the planning board discussion, but I think you were in the room potentially, so. Yeah. So at this point, we don't have any proposed changes to look at or discuss or anything. So with that, unless there's any questions for Pat or Dorothy, who's also happened to be at the meeting, we'll move on from this item. That sounds like we're gonna move on. Thank you for the update. Um, I also wanna say thank you for being our representative for one meeting. Um, Pat is leaving this committee, so we will have to elect another representative, but I appreciate your willingness to do so and attending that meeting too. Um, that brings us to presentation and discussion items. Maybe we'll get out of here really early. I doubt it. I know, housing policy, that one can take forever. Um, so we are to zoning bylaws, presentation discussion item 4A, which is the zoning bylaws, which was referred to us to recommend a, pro a plan for approaching zoning bylaw revisions. Um, we have had now two, three discussions on it, I think. Um, by my notes, and so I am going to attempt to, if I can find a screen mode. Oh. Is there one that will come on? I want to see if I can figure out a way to project it. What? Oh no, it, that's only when Amherst Media is live broadcasting. Projector control on. What do I have to hit, Athena, on this thing? Because I can't see. Oh, Solstice, so I just, ah, there we go, thanks. Let's see if I can do this. Number is 7277. Let's see if this works. Estab error establishing connection, so it might not work. We're gonna try it again. Five. While I keep trying to project this up, um, we have a revised version in the packet that if everyone could my computer is having problems connecting, but we're gonna try. So, yeah. So mine's not gonna connect right now, but um, if everyone could look, it was in the packet, it should be online for those that can get to the online packet. This is the flowchart, zoning bylaw process revision three. Um, the flowchart. So I'll keep trying to connect so that hopefully we can get this up on the screen. Um, but in the meantime. Do you want me to try my solstice and you can take over my computer and then project that? Yeah, you know, oh, did I type in the number right? 1931681028. Let me try one more time. Did 
open and then, yeah. and then if it doesn't, maybe you can try. But yeah, it's not working for me. Does it look blue in here? I don't know. Yeah, it's really, really weird. But it's just weird. But um, so this we talked about last week. We had a nice discussion last week. I went and revised based on comments from last week. So instead of our last meeting, instead of having two flowcharts, which we used to have, we now have one. Um, it's had added a lot of stuff. And so it was transmitted to the planning board. The planning board, my understanding, has had a discussion. I've talked to the chair, but we have two members of our committee that were at that meeting. So before I discuss and mention what I heard from the chair, it would be great, since I wasn't at the meeting, to hear from the people that were there what the planning board's feedback at that meeting and reaction to this was at that meeting. So I'm going to leave it to Pat and Dorothy, if they're willing, to talk a little bit about that. I don't have my notes with me, so I'm not going to have a lot to say. Um, there was a little pushback from a couple of members on the zoning board about how this was going to work, and um, some t a little tension there, but that I felt like got resolved as the discussion went on. Um, it, it, there was reference to the fact that it's basically what's been happening anyway with um, with, you know, that the process um, does look like it can be a collaborative one. Dorothy, do you have anything intelligent to add? Because <laughs> I have, I mean, <laughs> well, I'm uh, very sleepy. Okay. I'm, I'm told I get too close to the mic, so is it, how's this? That's good. Okay. It's so Push the button. <laughs> Not on the video. Okay. All right. I'm trying to remember, and I don't have those. Oh, okay. How's this work? Is this good? Okay. I'm trying to remember, and I don't have my notes with me, but I remember that the, there was concern from the planning board that what the back and forth should be at the beginning of the process more than at the end of the process. I think there was a feeling of uh, working their way all the way through and getting something and then having CRC or whatever say, Oh, no, no, not that, not that, was, was uh, kind of like undermining the authority of the planning board. So um, I would say openness to um, conversation and input, um, but um, they didn't like the idea of it getting radically changed near the end. Is that what you remember, Pat? Ah, yeah, take your mic. We'll just pass the mic back and forth so we don't have to hold it down. Um, so in my conversation with the planning board chair, I was told that it's similar to, I think, what you guys said, which was, in general, there was no real concern with what was sitting by the end of the discussion with what was presented um, in terms of it seems to follow state law, it does everything, but there was concern about Two things, one was, is this going to be every time, what's sort of the timing on stuff as the planning board or zoning subcommittee finishes a change? Are we going to be facing these hearings every other week, every month, um, or is there going to be sort of a basket where at some point, and, and how does that basket de get decided? Who gets that, who, who starts this formal process to start those timings and all of that? Um, concern about the changes that that you mentioned, you know, if there's no involvement of council and CRC and counselors prior to the start of this blue process where it's received by the council and the council hasn't been involved at that point, are, is there a potential for a large number of changes before or after the hearing? And if so, what happens at that point? Does it go back? Does it not go back? Um, stuff like that. I know there's a box down here at the very bottom that is what we talked about saying we don't really want those large changes to happen. From, from a committee point of view, I think our last meeting was that we didn't really want them to happen at this stage, but in order to do that, there needs to be some sort of collaboration and speaking and talking and communication prior to it formally coming to the town council. Um, so I, I think it kind of agrees with what you guys said. Yes, Dorothy. 
Um, there was concern that with the different rules, the different timing, so many days here, so many days there, that if, if the pieces of, of uh, suggested change amendments come along, that it would be just impossible to hold it in your head and to have any sense of where you were on any piece. Therefore, I think you use the term baskets, um, that the idea that there'd be small groups of, of zoning amendments coming forward so that we would know that all of them were it's seven days or 10 days or 20 days or whatever. Um, so that it wasn't Byzantine. That was really the concern, I think. That, that's similar to the process used by bylaw review is that we were going through everything, but we presented things. And then the ultimate, the big thing. Do you need thoughts from my right side of the table? Um, I know you guys weren't at that meeting, but, but there are some changes to this document right now, and it pretty much now doesn't attempt to set forth how that communication would happen in the early stages of drafting zoning amendments. Is this committee comfortable with that vagueness, I guess is the question? We're f focusing first on the part before the blue boxes. And yeah. uh, I think that the, it's, it's going to take for the new CRC to work through the process as it observes uh, how it proceeds with actual, um, you know, an actual revision to the planning. Uh, to the zoning bylaws, which is something that we have not had the benefit of. So we've been thinking of it on a theoretical level. We haven't had a testing opportunity. They are going to have the testing opportunity. What ideally will happen is that um, through just attendance at each other's meetings and the smaller group who are paying more attention, that there will be a dynamic relationship developing. Um, but we have to see. Hello. Hello. Yes. Okay. Yes, Dave. I just wanted to let the group know um, we are really focused on COVID-19 today. So I will be back hopefully about 10 o'clock. And if I can't be here, then uh, we'll send uh, Christine or Rob. So we are currently on the zoning discussion now. You are, okay. Um, we had two people attend the planning board meeting, so I think we might be okay. Okay, if, great. If you send them, we can just update them, or I, we can update after. Good. Yeah, my know. apologies, we're no. just really gearing up. No and, need to apologize. And, uh, we, we stated the social distancing yeah. on our group, sort of. Um, six, six feet, six feet. We're Remember not six feet. We're, six feet we're is kind of three. So. We're kind of three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. So maybe we can connect yeah. afterwards. You know, I think I might see you later today anyway. Mm -hmm. right. But thank you for stopping by, Dave, um, and updating us on that. It's more important that you be there. <laughs> Dorothy would like to ask you a question. Okay. Well, in reference to the big road work that's going to take place near the um, bridge in Northampton, I've been thinking of the fact that the hospital is on that side of the river, and I've kind of been wondering if there's any medical plans to have some kind of health facility on this side of the river. That's a great question. I will ask our public safety folks what the plan is. I don't think the, the work will interrupt movement of ambulances or you know EMS vehicles too coolly, um, but I will ask about that. I mean, we do have two urgent care facilities, one on Route 9 and one on U Drive. So and the one on U Drive is run by Cooley, an extension of Cooley, and the other one is private. So um, they're there, and, uh, but I'm sure that EMS folks on the Northampton side at Cooley Dickinson, as well as, as our folks are thinking, you know, making sure there are no disruption or delays based on that, um, on that construction. But it is, I do know, I've been in many conversations, many meetings where, um, 
setting up something larger on our side of the river has been discussed, and it is a monumental task. Now, given the times we're living in and, and the months ahead, um, there may need to be some, some looking at some triage options uh, uh, that might be larger on this side of the river. I wanted to make a, a comment. Um, having been in New York during 9-11, uh, the day after my son was supposed to be sworn into the bar in Manhattan, and we were stopped at the border of Nassau County by the police, and we were told we could not cross the border. Mm -hmm. So when I bought a home to be near my daughter, I made sure it was on the same side of the river because I, I do feel those boundaries matter. Yeah, no, so I would like us to be no, fully capable on this side of the river. No, that's a great point, and I think being proactive on that. So I, I'm going to a meeting now with um, uh, fire and police, and I will bring that up with them. That's a good point. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And now to return to zoning. <laughs> so it, Andy was saying, it, I think your comment on the prior to the chart issue that we're just going to have to figure it out and see what works. Is that an accurate summary? I think we have a plan in place, and we're going to have to just um, let the next group of CRT members look at it and try to implement it. And if it um, needs modification, they will have to cover that through the process. I think the new plan, as far as we can go, if we were continuing, I think we'd be in the same place. Any other comments on the essentially the white box at the bottom of this chart that talks about prior to it formally coming to town council? Seeing none, we'll move on to the actual chart itself. Um, so once it's received by town council, um, it then, and, and this is I think where the planning board also had some comments, it seems a little slow for the planning board to get to a point where they say, we're ready to move on this, we're ready to have our hearing, they have to send it to the council for the council to send it back to them. Um, a little redundant, a little that, but it clarifies exactly when that time period starts then, um, because there are strict time limits. So one explanation that was helpful when I was talking to the chair of the planning board was that the dotted boxes, which is, there's no key on this, um, are the sort of potentially optional type boxes where that section might not happen um, much. For example, this, and this occurs because when we combined the two charts, we went from a chart where it was, a ch there was a chart for things that didn't originate in planning board and a chart for things that did originate in planning board. And when they didn't originate in planning board, when they go to planning board from the town council, they've not seen it before. So there would need in say that first red box that's now dotted, they'd need to do that review. But if it came from them, that review's pretty much already been done. Yes, Dorothy. Somewhere in my notes just yesterday, I remember seeing that all zoning amendments will be originated from the planning board, which contradicts the statement that some of them would be originate from CRC. Is that your notes from a planning board meeting? I'm not sure. I'll, oh. I'll send them in the paper. So yeah, I, I think in the normal course of business, most amendments will originate in the planning board from their zoning subcommittee. Um, but counselors have every right to propose zoning amendments on their own as we've been doing with general bylaw amendments. But there's also the charter process for residents to propose. And so this is a chart that's attempting to accommodate any situation. Yes, Pat. I, I'm just wondering if Steve, if you have anything that would help us or help them understand what we see as the process in the beginning, where, where something can be referred from.
any, I have one comment I'd like to make, but I'd like to hear if there are any other comments on the flowchart as presented right now. I did not receive really any other requests, my knowledge, from the planning board other than potentially somewhere in here, maybe in that first blue box, indicating that there may be a hold and a collection of amendments before we start this formal flowchart thing. You know, I've, I've heard recommendations of twice a year, potential for four times a year, maybe three times a year, but trying to get on a schedule for the council and the formal hearings of we're going to do zoning amendment hearings these months. And so whatever's collected by this time, that's what goes forward for the formal hearings. Um, to sort of get the council in a schedule, to get the planning board in a schedule, um, and so that the public also isn't faced with uh, random hearings every time that they have a knowledge of when things might be formalizing. So that, that's a potential to add to this blue box. Um, any other comments? Would, would this committee support the addition of that concept into this flowchart? And I guess the question I have then is for this committee, is that basket better held by the planning board before they send them all to the council for formal referral or is that basket better held by the council? I think it should be held by the planning board. Uh, not to do that would get us into, an, I think, an oppositional state. Thoughts on that concept? Any discussion about how frequently these buckets, or however you termed it, would be uh, coming forward? So, uh, my understanding was there was mention of twice a year, similar to what town meeting had, you know, because of town meeting met twice a year. Um, there was more, I think, discussion or mention of four times a year, quarterly, sort of an intent to have if there's anything in that, say, basket or bucket, to do them quarterly. Do we have a preference to recommend to the council, because this is ultimately going to go to the council, um, to recommend to the council a schedule? Andy? You know, I, I don't want to have it go back to references to town meeting, because I yeah. think that we moved beyond town meeting as a community because town meeting was not working well for us as a community. And some of the examples that came up in the last discussion with Chris Brestrup were examples that a dynamic relationship allows the full development and then the presentation to the council in the hearing process to occur at an appropriate time when it's ready and not be forced by a twice a year schedule. And uh, so I think that we're uh, running into a danger of going backwards and not seizing the opportunity that we have been given with the charter uh, for year round government to um, deal with things as they come forward. Uh, for those who are involved, who are not at the last meeting, the example that I gave in particular was what happened with the proposal for form-based zoning, which was a North Amherst and um, Atkins area proposal. And if it had been um, a dynamic process, which we have now, it would have allowed back and forth between the um, legislative body and the planning board so that um, questions could be answered and it didn't need to move forward for an up or down vote on a forced time. And I think that we're running into a danger of going back to that. Dorothy. I agree. I don't think we want to set a schedule. I th just, we have discussed uh, when um, reasonable in, in groups uh, of, of, uh, of zoning amendments, but just say as needed. 
if something happened and we really needed a change and the planning board you know, really got on it and we all agreed we needed to do it, we should be able to do it. Steve? So on the other hand, that option already existed under town meeting, so there always could be a special town meeting if there was an urgent issue. Th there was something there was something good about um, having a specific deadline. So as much as we <laughs> try to get away from that and move to year round, there was something that was good about the deadline and having the zoning changes in a cluster, I think. And so there was even a move at the time of town meeting to do all that cluster once a year, you know, to do one of the town meetings would there's only one required town meeting, but to have Amherst regular or special town meeting, maybe have that focus on zoning, and then have the spring one focus on budget and everything else. Pat. I have a question for Steve. How much um, impact was that on changes to zoning regulations or issues that came up for appeals or anything during the year prior to the meeting where it was going to be dealt with or the two meet, Do you know what I mean? I'm just curious. Uh, um, I'm trying to figure out, uh, you know, you're saying with, and I am referring to town meeting, it happening twice a year and they were even thinking of bringing everything together for once a year. And I'm just wondering if you experienced uh, delays or, or uh, times where there were going to be definite impacts if a zoning bylaw wasn't changed or yeah. something like that, and how did that work? I just have no experience with that. Yeah. Um, I can't think off the top of my head of things that were earth-shattering, but for example, there were things like um, enabling 132 in the zoning bylaw to enable projects like 132 Northampton to you, you know, to be an applicant was, so that wasn't necessarily deadline specific, but, but yeah, so I can't think of anything that was sort of directly related to health, safety, and emergencies. I can't think of any emergency changes. Andy? We rarely had special town meetings, and there were reasons for that. There were myriad that are irrelevant now that we no longer have that form of government. Um, but we need to be thinking about moving forward to make the charter work, not working, not agonizing over what happened in the past. Uh, so I think if it is that for planning board purposes, it's good to have a couple of prime times of the year and then seize the opportunity when needed to either delay and have special a special yeah. section, which could be because of the complexity or uniqueness of an issue or because of the urgency of an issue, that there be a, a recognition that there should be exceptions to the process but to the greatest extent possible uh, that if it is important for the planning board functioning that there be uh, two primary times of the year, yeah. that that be the way it be put forward. So I think part of the discussion was not necessarily aimed for certain times of year in that um, you know, we're only going to work on zoning board, you know, zoning amendments January to March so that they can have the hearings in April, that it would be a year-round work, but there would be a collection. They might finish one in January, finish one in February, but we wouldn't be seeing them for the formal hearing one at, one at a time unless there's a need to bring it sort of out of a schedule. That, that was my understanding of what, when I talked to the planning board chair, that part of that concern was, was it's more efficient to bring them all at once in terms of the hearing, not in terms of the working. And if you miss that one, well, then you got three more months. You know, it, it shows up in the bucket when it's ready, 
but, but we're not holding hearings so that the planning board, they've got full schedules right now, adding in all those hearings adds to their workload too, whereas if you can do them all at once, it's a little more efficient for them too. Um, Andy. Of course, coming back for Steve, weren't there individual hearings on any major zoning change in, as opposed to grouped hearings? The question is, would there be a isolated hearing in advance of town meeting is it in the past? Is that the question? On each individual proposal that would become a separate article. Yep. So each article had its own unique hearing. Yes. So if we're, uh, it gets then, mm. are we doing joint hearings or are we not doing joint hearings? And if we're doing joint hearings, and each major proposal that would have been a separate article because it's a whole separate uh, set of issues for the planning board review, then moving forward, if we're doing joint hearings, uh, we still have to have that same process with multiple hearings. So I don't understand where the concern about having to have uh, these two large buckets is an advantage. I would think it would be a disadvantage because it doesn't allow things to um, flow as they're ready, but forces things to flow to meet a deadline. a question of Steve and he might be responding to this already can you do if you've got three is it possible with the planning board you know if there were three going to be three articles on three different types of amendments did the planning board hold the hearings all on the same night or were they always on sort of separate nights so consecutive but same night or separate nights um, I think we could do two or three at a time but at the the planning board also had to have site plan review right. yeah etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think we typically had the mental space to do up to three in a night. But some of them are, nothing's minor with the zoning bylaw, but some of them appear to be minor, so. So we also have to consider our, as a CRC, our obligations because as Andy mentioned, joint hearings. Um, joint hearings mean that this committee shows up at multiple meetings um, at night on Wednesday. Um, the more often that happens, the more potential we face is if the meeting time stays on Wednesday to double, double meetings in a day, multiple meetings in a week, even if it's not on a Wednesday. Um, and I think that was also from my thinking as a committee chair and work on the council, a potential benefit to trying to hold multiple hearings, maybe maybe we've been referring to the terminology wrong, but multiple hearings, multiple, or hearings on multiple items together, whether it's delineated as three hearings or one, on the same night at least, to save counselor time um, and efficiency in that purpose. Um, that was part of my thinking for liking this idea. I understand the concern about putting an artificial timeline. But what are people's thoughts? I know three of you will not no longer be facing this issue, but what are the thoughts on, on things like that? Dorothy. Um, I think that we don't need to set this all down. I think we could just, I think the chart is sufficient. I think that we have an understanding that where it makes sense and possible, we will do several, or the planning board will put together several items at once, and I think they're already doing that. Um, and then we'll just let it play out. I, I, think we, I think this is probably in the area of micromanaging at this time. Do we have any other, other thoughts on this chart for now? So I guess the question I have is, is this something that is ready for a vote today to send on to the council for potential adoption 
or is this something the committee would like to see come back at the next meeting for a final? There's right now I, I've heard one change, which is mention a potential basket, but if that basket is being held by the planning board, it might not even need to be in this flow chart, just part of a memo of thoughts on what goes on before the flow chart starts. Oh. So I would add potential, possibly. No, not, not a word that says must, but a word possibly in, in groups. I think that a lot of time has been spent on this chart and you've taken it back and forth, um, taken the count of people's concerns uh, on the planning board, and if it's going to be looked at by the town council, I think it's ready to go. Other thoughts? Do I have a motion to, I, it is not amended right now, the amendment would be nothing to this chart in essence, given what I'm hearing, it's not to the actual chart itself, it's to essentially an explanatory portion of a memo explaining the chart and presenting it. So is, if, if people are ready for a motion, do I hear a motion? Pat? Uh, I move that we send the uh, flow chart for zoning bylaw amendments to the council. And to recommend? To recommend. Recommending <laughs> adoption? <laughs> yes, thank you. I second that motion. Any further discussion? I just think that we've uh, hit upon the major points, the, but we need to move forward and as the CRC in the future, and the planning board experienced the process in real terms, it's amendable. Nothing set in stone. And I think that uh, it's time to move it along. I agree. Any other comments? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor of the motion to recommend the flowchart for zoning bylaw amendments to the council for adoption, raise your hand and say aye. 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 That is unanimous, 5-0. That brings us to item 4B on the agenda, the council housing policy, in which we are still in the very early stages of this discussion. I ask that everyone review the master plan section on housing and Demographics and housing is what it's technically called. Um, based on discussion last meeting that requested that maybe we go through some of our already adopted documents as we start to look at what type of policy we would want to recommend to the council that it would be good to know what we already have. And I thought the first part to start with is the master plan, even though it might get updated, but <laughs> but it's the updates are supposed to be necessary and obvious, so hopefully not much is changing in this one. Um, and so we talked last week a lot about how to move forward with coming up with a housing policy, right? And we weren't exactly sure how to do it. Um, so Dorothy had mentioned that we need to know what we have, what we want, where we are, and then maybe we could start drafting something or determine whether we need help at drafting something. So thoughts on the master plan section of demographics and housing and how we might be able to use that as a basis for jump starting a plan or a policy. Um, I would say that as I read through this again, that many things that are stated here do not reflect what has been happening. Uh, there's many statements of economically diverse housing types, but our newest buildings are not. Um, there's also um, mentioned in, in every large paragraph that it should be um, 
related somehow to preserving the quality of the neighborhood. I don't see that. Um, and I think that a lot of these things in here are very good, but they're aspirational and are not being enforced. Um, certainly the affordable housing uh, being included in, in diverse housing forms is not happening. In most of the time, it's not happening. Um, so there are, there are a lot of areas here which, you know, if this is a policy, then there has to be some way to enforce it. And I don't see that happening. Um, and then there's some statements that are made that aren't backed up. Um, for example, on the page 4.2, 4 it says, um, projections of population growth and demographic change for Amherst vary, but it is clear that the community's housing needs are changing and local housing pol policy needs to anticipate and accommodate those changes. I, that may be totally true, but I would like to have some, uh, some evidence and things to back up and to say what kind of changing, how is it changing? Um, does it mean we still don't have young families looking for homes? Um, later on, it mentions that there needs to be more elderly housing, but it's assisted living, which is a whole very complicated thing, which um, I, I don't see as part of the, the town of Amherst goal because those are very expensive, generally privately operated places. Then there are, are areas where you could just drive a truck through it. Uh, when allowed two family houses by right in all residential zoning districts, and then the next thing is uh, allow them to be on smaller pieces of land, but nowhere does it say owner occupied. So the, as written here, I see that as not a desirable thing to just say let's have multiple two family houses anywhere where before the zoning was for a one family house without any description of what they would be. Um, there are uh, strategies on cre increasing the percentage of affordable and or moderately priced units um, that was, those are not being enforced. Um, and then there was one that was interesting, setting aside land for affordable units. And, you know, I think that's a great idea. Um, we don't seem to have much land. Um, but, so that's not, that's not really listed very much. Um, it talked about fast-tracking subdivisions. Um, do we have those anymore? Is that one of the things that we want? Um, they're just, there are a lot of interesting things here, but it, it didn't seem to match. What I read here did not match what I've seen in the um, planning board and the, and the zoning, the ZBA. I just, it, it's a lack of match, a very big one. Um, so also one of our conundrums is the question of apartments with several bedrooms. Is this actually potentially family housing or is it, as other people say, very uh, attractive to kind of dorm-like housing? Um, the question of apartments being built for students downtown really is, I think, only mentioned once um, in a way that's kind of conf very conflicting. Um, so um, I, I, just, I just found it, it needs a tremendous amount of work to bring it up to where we are, but I don't really like where we are. So uh, I would like to, I think it needs a lot of work. Pat. Uh, it seems to me that the master plan is aspirational, and that's a positive. Uh, it's showing the direction that we want our zoning uh, bylaws and our planning to head, um, and it addresses a lot of inequities uh, across the town. Um, so I, I feel that in terms of what it's saying, I don't uh, have a lot of, I don't see a lot of change that I would want. Um, I am interested in what Christine is doing, the planning director is doing in terms of what actions have happened, what hasn't happened, what effect has something had. And without that information, I think personal opinions um, are important, but our, our view needs to open up somewhat to uh, look beyond just what we like to a broader idea of what housing needs are across Amherst. Any other thoughts? Andy. I think the problem that I have here is that when you look at the sequence of how the plans were developed, the master plan was the first base document that was, um, as has been noted, 
in some ways aspirational, and that the housing production plan and some of the uh, and a lot of the other work is more specific and followed. And it's hard to look at the master plan in isolation with those other documents and studies that the master plan provoked. And uh, so I, I don't know where we go from here. I think that the, um, a key issue that has been identified and needs to be continued by the CRC going forward is the question of whether we need to try and grapple with all housing at one time or whether as a practical matter, we need to work on the affordable housing section separate from other housing issues and what the consequences are to that um, decision. And then, uh, because I think that what we sort of recognized is if we take on all housing as a council and CRC takes it on as a committee, it's a lot more um, complex process even. And uh, so that's, uh, I guess, a key decision that I think I need to pass on to the next group of committee members. Does Keith have any thoughts? Not right now. So I, I, I'm gonna take the time to say my thoughts. As I was reading the master plan and as I was gathering other documents, like the housing production plan, I realized I should have had us read all of them. <laughs> um, and, and, but it was too late last night at nine to be like, so go ahead and maybe we should have paid attention to all of these for tomorrow's discussion. Um, so I, I agree with what Andy said with that. Um, but as I was reading the master plan, one thing that struck me was it was like, this is almost a policy. In a sense, it is a policy. So what is a separate policy look like? And so then I started Googling city, city housing policies without putting cities in because I was curious, could I find stuff? And there's a lot of master plans out there. I didn't spend a lot of time doing this, but, but there, are, there are city policies. Um, I found one from Minneapolis. I think I found one in California. I think it might've been Sacramento or something that are hundreds of pages long, but include things like the actual regulations for inclusionary zoning or for TIFs and for you know tax incentives, tax write-offs, the actual regulations. And that, in, that made me think, I'm not sure that's where we're going with a policy or where we want to go with a policy. So the question that brought to my mind was, do we need to decide what our policy in terms of sort of what a template policy looks like, how detailed are we going to get before we start talking about taking the master plan goals, talking to Chris, seeing what has already been adopted and implemented strategy-wise, what's not, then making decisions as to what we want to focus on for the next five or 10 years. Do we need to sort of decide how in depth we go first? before we go to what we want to include. I did find one town, city's housing policy that was two pages. Um, so it did not include, it didn't include all of the specific regulations. It said, here's our focus points of, you know, we're going to focus on affordable housing and this is the part of affordable housing we need to focus on, or for zoning, here's the changes we need to focus on things like that, so a little more specific than the strategies in the master plan, but not the actual regulations for, say, inclusionary zoning, which some of these cities included in their 150-page housing policy. Um, so thoughts on that, Dorothy. First of all, inclusionary zoning is, is very strong in this plan, but it is not being strongly enforced in uh, Amherst at this time. But one of the big things is the goal that is expressed all through this is for some kind of, it's creating more diverse, moderately priced and affordable housing options in proximity to goods and services. And what we've been having are one type buildings, uh, like all student buildings or little teeny apartment buildings. Um, and they're, 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 the 
The goal that's stated here, that there should be diverse neighborhoods that should represent different uh, levels of economic um, abilities, whatever, that they should be mixed, that's not what's happening. And I think that that's a very good goal. And so I hate to think of it as purely as an aspirational goal. So I, I think that something, I think our policy is not, does, is not what's happening is not mi matching the master plan. And so if you're gonna have a, a plan that sets it out, then it should be, uh, be we should be see, seeing that happen, and we're not seeing it happen. Steve and then Andy. So just for the record, in the last 10 years, there have been two buildings built that were, are restricted to students that have gone through the town permitting process. So one is Olympia Place, the big white building, and the other one is at Amherst College Dormitory at the end of Lincoln. So there have been a number of other apartment buildings that are um, often represented as being all students or mostly students. I don't know if that's true or not, but the, it is a free market, and we do have, you know, we do have um, um, restrictions on, it's a, basically, I'm, I'm gonna say it's a free market, so it may be possible that at this moment they are more students and not students, but they were not developed for, and I'm not sure if that's what's being referred to, but they're not all student buildings. And also, we should also think about scale. So not much has been developed privately in Amherst in a long time, especially in the visible part of Amherst, right? In the, in the downtown core. And then the last 10 years, we've seen quite a bit of building downtown. But if that had, if Amherst had developed more organically, those would have been one of many others that, so what we're looking at is, you know, it's like the first locuses that come up. So we can't assume that all flowers are locuses because those are the first ones to come up. Andy. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it's important not to just isolate the downtown buildings because when you look at what has been built in housing in Amherst, there's actually a lot of housing that's been built in Amherst. Uh, and uh, maybe this comes because I've lived here for 40 years and I look at it from a 40 year span. And, uh, you know, when I was uh, moved to Amherst, Amherst Woods didn't exist. Um, there was uh, the area where Shalini, which is I think the most recent, didn't exist. There were pockets of housing in North Amherst that were farm fields. Um, but all of them were pretty much developed on the model of a single family house on a identifiable and fairly large uh, piece of land. And uh, as a result, that's why there is an opportunity to build a lot of things and now we're being forced into what's left is in infill opportunities in the core of the, um, the town. And I um, therefore don't think that it's fair to say that all of the housing development has been of a single type and that it's these few build, big buildings that have attracted number, that have been um, marketed and attracted at least a significant number of students if not being exclusively students because I think that the largest number of housing that's been built has been individual housing of a fairly high price point that has skewed the market and forced people who can't afford that price point to look elsewhere than Amherst for their housing and we now have to develop a policy that encourages us to move forward from where we are Dorothy. I'm, I'm not just talking about the buildings downtown. Uh, we have very expensive houses that families could live in. We have almost no housing for a young family, a uh, family or a couple that's going to have a child or that has a small child. Everything that's, been, that, that's come before us this year, there is almost no outdoor space of any kind. So let's just say um, East Street Commons, Main Street Commons, the proposed you drive uh, apartment. Um, and one East Pleasant and Kendrick Place, none of them have outside any space that if you were a, a mother with a child or two children, 
that would seem to be a comfortable fit. Uh, so there's, most of the things that are being built are small and are for individuals. Some are aimed towards students. I think that it's a mix of maybe young professionals and students in some of these buildings. But the area that's, that's absolutely blank that I think that is very upsetting is any place for a family that is not rich in this town. And it's just, that's why we're losing them. So I don't think it's going to happen. I think that kind of housing requires maybe a couple of bedrooms, um, but it also requires some outdoor space, and that is being shrunk. All of the re things that have come have shrunken parking and have shrunken outdoor space in order to add more units. And the, they come before the board with a certain number of units. They get a, a nice discussion. It sounds good. And almost every single group has come back and increased the number of units, almost doubling them the next time they come before the boards. So I think very soon we will have satisfied a lot of, need, um, of the need for housing of single people. But I don't see uh, much for couples, and I certainly see nothing for young families. So I think the town is going to have to work on that. You can't just leave it up to the private market that can make more money in providing housing for people that don't have children. Andy? Then, then the question is, uh, how is the private market, which ultimately is who builds the buildings, going to economically afford to, to do what we would like them to do? We can only develop a policy that is based upon what is possible. Uh, if I were to continue on the committee, one of the things that I would have done was to try and make sure that we had a conversation with those who are, who are building things as to what is economically feasible to do now. How much does land cost and what are the choices you have to make in order to build something on that piece of land that is commensurate with the price point of the piece of property. And that's where we kind of have to go moving forward, not go backwards, because if we went backwards, what we would have said was, gee, we don't want to have all these half acre lots. We'd like to have cluster developments that have the kind of housing that you described. But we didn't do that. We got to go from where we are now, not where we might have been in the past. I'm thinking about capitalism. <laughs> um, it, it does seem that the uh, new development in North Amherst is not filling up. It's very expensive. Um, it is, it's not clear uh, what the economic impact will be on the people who have created these buildings and what kind of uh, price adjustments might happen down the road. Mill, yeah, yeah, sorry. I was going to say Cindy Jones things, but it's not hers anymore. You know, but, but the other piece for me is I've heard people saying similar things to you, Dorothy, and um, coming here and then saying, oh, no to smart growth, no to infill that or, or five-story buildings that include plantings and, and cantilevered sections so they don't seem so imposing. So it, I think that one of the things that this town needs to do is really open up its imagination, look like Andy says, right where we are, where are we, and then how can we create the kind of growth that we want? Um, and, and I would like to see a lot more imagination um, and I think that's possible. Yeah, and I don't disagree with, I mean, I agree with, you know, all these comments. I, do, I have to say one thing, though. Um, Kendrick Park is an amazing resource for downtown. And so it basically, the idea that Kendrick Park will now be more used because there's housing on it. And, in, you know, there'll be a playground there, but, I mean, we, there already is activity there, but that is a shared resource in the same way that a parking garage is a shared resource. So that's how cities are developed, that not each particular building provides its own yard, but there's a shared yard that's used by, by the community. But I would, so my dream is that 
um, those young families that move to East Hampton and you know into a mill building or into a, a loft, that they have an alternate here in Amherst. So that I mean, I think that is a real missed opportunity that we're not finding places for young families who want urban living, right, to live, are not finding a place here. So that that is in my opinion, a, um, a missing link in this. And the other missing link is, are people empty nesters, so the other end, you know, people that are, well, yeah, that um, living in town could be a very attractive option for someone like me, but there's, right now there's nothing that, you know, I mean, we live pretty close to town as it is. But I would love the idea of living in a, you know, even closer to town. In, in that case, you'd love living in a place closer to town with no responsibilities to take care of your yard. That's exactly right. Yes, which is something that a lot of people want. Yeah. Right here, right at Park. With the town taking care of it. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is potential way forward on how we get to a housing policy. Um, we've had a good discussion. We don't have to stop that discussion now, but what I'm hearing is there's a lot of opinions on what we're missing and that the master plan might address some of that with strategies, but where we go from here is to identify what we want to emphasize and turn that into a housing policy. And so a big, you know, uh, if you're looking at a big, overarching one to throw one out there might be some sort of, um, you know, the economic diversity in housing or something, or, or as Andy said, you know, the, it's embedded the, the density or something, and then say, well, what are the strategies or what is our plan for creating the ability for developers to get and produce that type of housing and then setting forth those strategies and saying here are our priorities for getting there and not only are those, and that priority might be zoning changes or it might be enacting additional TIFs and then who in town is responsible for doing that or how do you follow through on that. You know, so taking those strategies that might be in the master plan, identifying some that have already been done, identifying more, identifying new ones maybe, putting them under a group and saying here's our top priorities for them. That's sort of what I'm hearing from this discussion that might be a way forward in creating a policy. Of course, that takes a lot of work um, and, and a lot more discussion as to what's most important and all. Um, but I know some of us are not going to be on the committee, but does that sound like a potential way forward towards trying to create more of a policy? Because if we're creating a housing policy, that's something the town can follow and say, oh, is this zoning change going to promote that policy or not? In addition to all the other master plan stuff it, it needs to not be inconsistent with, um, is this funding mechanism at CPA going to promote that policy? Thoughts? There's none. Dorothy. Okay. One of the things that's been brought up, uh, particularly, I guess, at the zoning subcommittee, is that some, so often the housing that is being um, uh, provided or being built is for a small number of people and a certain type of, of, of a client to move in, leaving no room for families and, and people to change, whether they're, they start off as a single person, then they become a couple, then maybe they become a family. And it's always, well, well, if you change and don't fit our little model, you have to move out of the building, which creates uh, an instability and makes for a more transient kind of town where you say, well, I'm living in Amherst when I can, but then when if I ever have to do this, I have to leave. So I think we just need to have more diversified housing. And, you know, in terms of what the town gives, well, okay, Kendrick Park, the town is, has, is fixing that up. They're paying for it with the help of, of grants. Good infrastructure is a, a contribution that the town gives. Uh, the roads, the sidewalks, uh, the trees. Um, I think Amherst does a lot of things and is doing, planning to do more in creating um, those um, things around the housing that would be good. But I, I just really want to have 
housing where in the same building, if we're going to have a high-rise building in downtown, in the same building could be students, could be people in affordable housing, could be seniors who want the urban experience, and could be some young families. Uh, I think that's what a community is, instead of these little silos of all one type of people in, in this house, and that house, and that house. That, that creates isolation and lack of community. Andy? I guess there's one thing that I wanted to just share with the, uh, everyone, and that is if you, um, and I wish we uh, had gotten Solstice up because I put it on the screen to make it really easy, but I can't. Um, if you look at the uh, pl uh, town website under the um, planning and zone, um, under departments, and you work through planning and zoning, you get to a thing called documents, and there's a thing there called town information, and one of the things in there is a piece called housing, and uh, I've since um, Mandy's sitting next to me, I can show her, but I can't show anyone else. When you look at the chart, as to housing values for the countywide and housing values for Amherst, and you look at the, what's happened since 1970, you see that it becomes more and more divergent where the, um, we started out at a point where the, the, um, the lines for county and Amherst were fairly close to each other. After 1980, they begin to totally diverge. And so since then, the, the difference has been much greater. And I think, you know, it's that kind of data that we really need to say, why did that happen? Is it too late? Can we reverse it? And I... Can you explain it a little bit more? What diverges? I see, I see, I can see your chart, but I don't know. Uh, the home, house values. The, 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 the top line in that chart is Amherst, and the second line down is county. The third line is median income. Um, so, th you know, there has been a trend. The trend has happened for a reason. Um, it's the, you know, question of what land is available and the policies, the economics, the, the desire to move into communities what choices have been made, but it is what has happened. And if we're going to try and do anything to reverse that chart, I'm not sure it's possible, but if it is possible, what is it? Those are the kinds of questions that we really need to be delving into as a council and through the next work of CRC. And to my two colleagues in the back of the room, good luck. Steve. Yeah, yes. I, uh, I'm looking at the chart that Andy's referring to. I suspect some of that's bubble related because it takes us to 2000. And that was a period when the lenders were casting a blind eye to the income, the ability to pay back. So that I'll bet that that diversions, I'd love to see that now in 2020 to see if those numbers have come closer together. So it sounds like we're winding down this conversation for today. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd want to say or any suggestions for as we go forward with this conversation, how to frame it and how to best move forward to getting towards the creation of a policy? Dorothy. Well, I forget whether it was Andy or Steve, but they expressed something that I have thought about. I really would like to have a conversation with developers to talk about what are, you, what are you planning to do. I mean, for example, on East Pleasant Street, a lot of stuff is going to happen there. And I don't know at this moment how many different groups of people own the property. Yeah, it's going to be greatly changed. And is it just going to be done a little piece by piece so we get this kind of um, mishmash? Or what is going to happen there? How is it going to relate? 
And we can't tell them what to do, but they can tell us what they're thinking of doing and what their problems are. And we can tell them some of our aspirations and we can see if there's any way that we can get a little closer in those things. I, I just don't like this idea that different groups and people, things are gonna happen to you and one day you come and you say, find something is built there by a person who had every right to do so, right? But it's not part of any kind of coherent plan. Seeing none, we will move on from item 4B and we will close that discussion for today and it will show up on the next agenda. Item 4C was another anticipation. So we are not dealing with CRC meeting times. Um, that was an anticipation of the committee being restructured before today. So that will show up on next week's or next meeting's agenda. Um, takes us two minutes. Um, the first one is the adoption of the February 26th draft minutes. Um, does anyone have any recommended changes or requested changes to those draft minutes? They were put in the packet last night. Um, I guess the minutes would be clear if the TSO charge were in there. the section you're, you're referencing? I have something on page three. Uh, the motion, um, Schreiber second, motion moved second by Pam to recommend the town council adopt the proposed resolution adopting an interim affordable housing policy as amended with blue language. I guess I would have liked the wording of that in there. Sometimes when you read over minutes, Oh. And if it refers to things and you don't have it in front of you, you don't know what you're really reading. So the document will, is referred to at the bottom as documents referenced. Um, could it be summarized? So we could, let's see at the top of that, two options for the final paragraph. So the very second, if you go onto page two, under resolution on interim housing policy, the second paragraph summarizes sort of the difference in the two options. Paragraph are you on? It says members discussed two options for the final paragraph of the resolutions discussed using the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust draft affordable housing policy as the interim policy while the council develops and adopts a policy. They discuss terms with concerns with adopting that draft po policy as it contains specific goals. So that sort of discusses one of them. We could add in some sort of explanatory language. We'd have to craft it before we adopt the minutes today. Um, but, but down at the bottom of page four, um, packet materials documents presented does talk about the interim affordable housing policy resolution draft and that does have all of the colors on it. it it's always a pain to refer to a specific other document but, but it could be found with those colors. And the motion is is the motion so we can't change the motion language. That was the motion language. <laughs> Any, so, so we're not gonna make any changes with that. Any other requested changes or any other, any requested changes? Seeing none, I will take a motion to adopt or approve the minutes as presented for February 26th. So moved. Andy moved it, Second. Pat seconded it. Any other discussion? All those in favor of adopting the February 26th minutes as presented, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. That is 5-0, adopted as presented. That brings us to item 5B. This does not have a vote. This is just an announcement prior, back in September or October, this committee voted to um, assign Pat the responsibility of approving back minutes um, from minutes that had not been in front of the committee already and we finally got together to make sure that happens as another housekeeping matter and so she has approved 
the minutes of the April 11th, 2019, April 24, 2019, May 1, 2019, May 8, 2019, May 15, 2019, that was joint with the council, May 15, 2019, that was joint with the planning board, June 5th, June 12th, all 2019, July 17, 2019, and August 7, 2019 minutes. So they were all in your packet. After this meeting today, they will all be uploaded into the CRC minutes page on the town website. Um, that completes all of the back minutes. So I want to thank Pat for reviewing all of them for us. Um, I, I will say she had done that a while ago and I never followed up. So part of the delay was me. Um, there were three that we had finally done. So part of that delay was me and I said, ah, we're changing membership. We really do need to just finish this item. I do want uh, to say that initially when I started doing it, I was changing all of the minute formatting to meet the current council formatting and that became overwhelming so that the last sets of minutes that were done, um, I corrected spelling and things like that yeah. and nothing else. Yeah. But we are caught up, up to date. I thank you very much, Pat, for doing that. Um, and I will thank Athena for doing all of the uploading of them within the next couple days. She has already been warned. <laughs> so, but I asked her not to do it till we formally announced at the meeting that, that those were approved. Um, that brings us, I believe, to announcements. So the announcements I have are to thank tremendously and express my thanks to the three members that are leaving this committee. And this is their last meeting, and that is Pat, Dorothy, and Andy. It has been a pleasure working with you. Um, I think for some, I might still be on a committee, but for others, I may not. But it's sad to change committees, but you've been a great asset to this committee, and so Thank you for all the work. Thank you, Pat, for representing us on the planning board and for doing all those minutes. Um, you've stepped up for all of that, and we'll have to find someone else to represent us to the planning board on the master plan update. Um, so this is their last meeting. That means next meeting we will be joined by three new members. Two of them are in the audience. Um, Evan Ross will be joining us. Shalini Bal Milne will be joining us. And um, Sarah Swartz will be rejoining this committee because she originally was on this committee. So we will be welcoming her back to this committee. Um, we will potentially be changing times. We'll see what works for the new committee so that for people watching, it may not remain at 8.30 on Wednesdays, but we will see and any meeting changes will be updated as they happen. Um, I think that is the only announcement I have. Does anyone else have any announcements? Andy. Well, I I can't help but do the flip side, though. It, it, to, uh, we've had two people who've served as chair of the committee, both who are the continuing members of the committee. And um, I want to thank both Steve, who got the committee launched and has brought incredible experience in planning and as a member of the planning board, um, as well as his professional work. Um, to this committee to provide the insight and I'm pleased that he's continuing and then when we made the change in chair partway through the year um, uh, it, it, it's a difference of style but it was um, the organizational skills that Mandy brought to it have, have really been a strength to the committee too so I think that we've been uh, blessed with the service of two people who did a lot of work for the committee and providing leadership for the committee. I want to thank them and wish both of them continued uh, success in working with new members and continuing the work that we started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I won't miss 8.30 meetings on Wednesday. <laughs> Wondering if we can get that changed. <laughs> has been a good mix, so it, it'll just be different going forward. Next meeting agenda preview, if there are no other announcements? No others? Um, item number seven is next meeting agenda preview. We will have the election of the chair and the vice chair that will be run by, I believe, our council president. Um, we will have a discussion on general meeting times. We will continue with the standard items of master plan update revisions as they come forward. That's going to be a continuing agenda item. 
council housing policy will be continuing agenda item. Um, there may be coming soon, I doubt it for next meeting, but I just don't know um, if we're forwarding this bylaw process for zoning bylaw revisions to the council, there is at least one zoning bylaw change coming shortly, and that could be weeks to a month or two on voting quantums for, um, I believe it's special permits. So, or no site plan reviews, I think. Um, so as soon as I can get the draft language, um, once it's, you know, once it's presented, I know the planning board's been working on draft language, so hopefully we will have some draft language soon to be able to talk, discuss prior to the formal forwarding and, and all as, as we try the draft process that we now recommend that the council take. So that may show up on the agenda, it may not. Um, and I'll, does anyone else have any potential agenda items to suggest at this point? Not seeing any. Um, that means any items not anticipated by myself. Anyone want to bring up anything they need to discuss today? Oh, Pat. At 6.15 a.m. this morning, 74 years ago, I was born. <laughs> and so I am entering my 75th year. Well, happy birthday, <laughs> Pat. <Thank you. laughs> That is fantastic. And, and to spend it at 8.30 a.m. on at a committee meeting just shows your dedication. <laughs> and then you're going on to another committee meeting, four hours of committee meetings on your birthday. Uh, that's dedication right there. I, I'm amazed. Um, so any other items not anticipated? Seeing none for the last meeting for three of our members for a while, I grant you 30 minutes of early leave. <laughs> we are adjourned at 10.03. <laughs>